inequalities become the issue out there. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, the president, he's been talking about inequality for, for months. And he's just uh, last month, he said it is the defining issue of our generation. And, of course, when politicians say something like that, you know that it's been building up in places like the University of Michigan and other <coughs> universities for a long time. This is there's been a, a concerted effort particularly on the left, to bring this idea of inequality as a problem, inequality as getting worse, as a major, major issue. Inequality is immoral, is wrong, is something offensive, something we should all rebel against. And this has been building momentum for, for years now, really for 40 years uh, at the very least, but it, it seems to be manifesting itself politically in a way that it has never before. If you, if you watched uh, Obama's uh, State of the Union day before yesterday, um, inequality is what, his, his argument against inequality is really what shapes all this administration's policies. I mean, what's the point of Obamacare at the end of the day if not to reduce inequality? I mean, what really offends them about the common medical system is that some people get the best health care in the world. Most of us in America, if you have good insurance, you're getting the best health care in the world. When some rich guy in Europe gets sick, he doesn't go to the number one rated health care system by the UN in the world, which is France. Like uh, Berlusconi. Prime Minister of Italy, really rich guy, right? He got sick. He didn't go to France, which is right across the border. It's right there, right? He flew to Mayo Clinic. Right? He came here. He came to the U.S. My dad is a doctor in Israel, socialized medicine in Israel. When he had a patient who had the resources and it was really, really sick, and Israel has a great medical system, right, because it has more doctors per capita than any place in the world. It's the Jewish state after all. Right? <laughs> My dad would fly the guy to the US, to the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, lots of options. So, what really upsets the left is this idea that some people have this great healthcare system and then other people do not. Other people either you know, haven't got insurance or don't get that service because they can't afford it, but that there's this discrepancy. That's what offends them. So, what do we do? What does Obamacare do? It tries to equate it. And it doesn't bother anybody, or it doesn't seem like it bothers anybody, that in order to equate it, it means reducing the quality of health care that many of us are going to get, as long as it raises these guys a little bit, and there's equality. What drives it is equality. What drives the discussion about the minimum wage? Because what does the minimum wage do? And this is Economics 101. This is in. This is not in dispute. And if you don't believe me, just read Paul Krugman's econ book, not his New York Times column, where he lies, but his <laughs> econ textbook where he's trying to be an economist. Because when he's actually an economist, he tells you, if you have a minimum wage, you increase unemployment. And if you raise it, unemployment increases because it's a price control. And when you control prices, right, in this case you're controlling the price of labor, you get what? You get fewer jobs. You get fewer opportunities. Because there's only so many jobs I can offer you at 10 bucks. At 5 bucks, there are many more jobs. Because even if you can only produce $4 an hour, I'm not going to pay you seven. I'm not going to lose money on you. So the only economically sound minimum wage is a minimum wage of zero. So why have the minimum wage? Well, because aid makes people feel good. Right? But it takes people earning a little, it takes people earning a lot, and it bumps the people to making a little a bit above to get this equality thing. And the fact that some people are now dropping off, we'll just pretend that's not happening. And that's what they literally do. They pretend it's not happening. They come up with bizarre economic theories to explain why that doesn't happen. Even while they know that's just not true.
So what's driving much of the economic debate, higher taxes on the rich, why do we have a progressive income tax, and why does Obama want to raise taxes on the rich constantly? And he'd raise them much higher if he could, if he had the House of Representatives and the Senate in his, in his hand. He would raise them much higher. What drives much of the left agenda is this idea, this myth, this striving towards equality. Now, what's wrong with equality? And we're talking about here equality of outcome. Or, you know, and, and I've debated professors about equality. And they all say, look, I, you know, nobody believes everybody should be exactly equal. We want, you know, and then you ask them, how unequal should it be? And, you know, they can't tell you. But, but they want it more. Because the goal, the platonic ideal, the thing they're striving towards is this true equality of outcome. And conservatives are not a lot better than that, right? Because conservatives don't talk about equality of outcome, but they, you know, their only com comeback to equality of outcome is, oh no, we don't believe in equality of outcome. That's communism. And you're supposed to know that's bad instant, you know, instinctively, right? What are they for? Equality of what? Opportunity. Opportunity. So they want to take our opportunities and they want to equate them. We'll talk about that in a minute, right? But there's this notion that somehow equality is a good thing. It's a positive thing. It's a wonderful thing. And I have no idea where that comes from. Well, I know exactly where it comes from, but it doesn't make any sense. Because look around the world. I mean, none of us are equal to any of us on anything. We're all completely different. Inequality is metaphysical, which means it's in reality. It's not something you can change. It's, you can't make people equal. We, we've been born with different genes. We, we've been born to different parents. Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are good looking, some of us are ugly. You know, we're all kinds. I mean, isn't that cool? I actually like inequality, right? If we were all exactly the same, it would be kind of boring. So, we are metaphysically different. To, to, to try to change, to try to eliminate inequality is like trying to eliminate gravity. Inequality, difference, is in reality. It's right there. It's how we are. It's not changeable. It's fighting against existence. And that can never be right. And this is true, by the way, of equality of opportunity. I mean, do we all have the same opportunities? all born again to different parents, different genes, no different people, exposed to different things. I mean, that's just life. That's just life. So whenever somebody wants to do something that goes against nature, against reality, I go, whoa, something's wrong. This doesn't quite make sense. This attempt to, to, to force nature to behave differently than its nature, first of all, can't work. And secondly, doesn't make any sense. So what can they do, right? They can't eliminate completely. So they say, yeah, okay, it's it's metaphysical, but we can do we can we can work to reduce the gap, right? We can make us more equal, right? We can uh, take money from some people and give it to others and, 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 and eliminate that equality. And how do they justify that? Because taking money from some people and giving it to others, you know, we if I did it, I'd go to jail, right? But if the government does it, if, you know, if intellectuals do it in theory, then it's okay. But how do they justify it? Well, to justify it, they have a whole theory now about the fact that the wealth that you create is not really yours. And again, notice that Obama did this as well. Before he ever started talking about inequality as the defining issue of our time, he had to talk about something more fundamental. What did he say? You didn't build it. You didn't build it. You didn't create the wealth that you have. You didn't own the money that you've owned, right? It's not yours. It belongs to that wonderful teacher you had and the people who built the roads and the, all this other stuff. Because if I'm going to take money from one person and give it to another, I have to justify that. And the justification they come up with is it's not yours. It's ours. In the State of the Union, he didn't say that the wealthy earn more money than the middle class or than the poor. What he said, I 
which is important is that the rich take more money. Take from who? How do you get wealthy? How do you get rich? How did Bill Gates get rich? Well, he created software, right? He built software, but okay, lots of people built software. What did he have to do in order to get rich? He sold it to us, right? He sold it to us. So Bill Gates, I don't know, made seventy billion dollars for himself by selling us something that cost, let's say, a hundred bucks. So if you bought software from Microsoft for hundred bucks, how much is it worth to you? Hundred bucks. No, well, more than more, more than a hundred bucks. bucks. It was just worth exactly hundred bucks. <laughs> Who'd bother, right? You wouldn't bother to give up to change it, right? It's worth more than a hundred bucks, so you're happy to give up the hundred bucks to get it. And it turns out that if you really think about how much a piece of software as basic as, let's say, DOS was, or the operating system, or even your word processor, there were many, many, many multiples of $100. You're willing to give up $100 and get something more valuable than $100 to you. So your life is better off, right? Microsoft made money. Bill Gates made money. He made money by making your life better, by improving your life. Nobody lost. Everybody's better off. So you become wealthy by creating value, by making stuff. But it's by making something, you make it, and then by trading for it. You're not taking. When I give you the software, or when Bill Gates gives you the software and gets 100 bucks, what's he taken from you? He's given. Without Microsoft, we're a lot poorer. All of us are a lot poor. This is the, the whole taking notion is the notion of a zero sum world of a pie out there. And we each have to grab a piece and you know the rich grab you know grabbing bigger pieces and the poor grabbing little pieces, right? But it's a finite pie, it's a zero sum world according to this story. And you know, there's some validity to this. If you lived in the 1600s, how did the rich get rich? By stealing, by taking. The world was a zero sum game. Wealth was not created. Trade was not possible. But over the last 250 years, wealth has been created. The pie has grown bigger, much bigger, dramatically bigger. I mean, how many people were poor 250 years ago? Percentage of the population. 99% is a good number, right? 1% were the aristocrats, and 99% of the people were poor. How many people are poor today by the standard of 250 years ago? Nobody. Nobody in America. I mean, in Africa and in Asia, there are people who are poor just like 250 years ago. But in America, there's nobody that poor. Nobody. Nobody in America doesn't live better than the aristocrat 200 years ago, 100 years ago. I mean, everybody has running water, electricity, a cell phone, a car. Many, many poor in America have air conditioning. I don't know why you would need it here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Heating. <laughs> I mean, the standard of living of everybody has risen. Everybody has risen. So who took from whom? So there's some world is, is such an obvious myth when you live in the 21st century. I mean, you could somehow excuse it 200 years ago. You cannot excuse it today. Who did, who did we exploit this money for? Where did this wealth come from? Who did we exploit? To get it Martians? Are Martians poorer now because we're richer? Because that's the only people I can think of people. That's the only you know explanation I have for this zero sum. There's no way to take it from. <laughs> what the last 250 years of human history have proven is that the pie grows. We create the pie. We create bigger and bigger pies by using our minds, by applying them to the problems of production, by creating stuff. We make the pies bigger. And it's we make it. I make it. You make it. Every one of you makes whatever pie you make. And some people make big pies because they create enormous value that people are willing to pay for. And some of us make small pies because people are not willing to pay me. To come and speak, right? My pie is small, but I'm happy with the small pie. Right? 
So I always make choices to, to, to only make small pies in the sense of material goods. But it's our pies. There's no collective pie that we take from. But note that they have to use this language because they want to use force. They want to take from some people and give to others. And they know that the first step in order to do that is delegitimize the property rights of the people they're taking from. Delegitimize the fact that they own the wealth that they've produced. So they have to undercut the idea that they even produced it. They have to collectivize wealth, turn it into wealth as a societal thing. And now some smart people have to sit back and think, you know, the philosopher kings have to sit back and think and say, okay, how much does Joe get? How much does Paul get? How much does Sarah get? And let's make a decision. That's, you know, how they're building up to this idea that they're going to redistribute wealth on a massive scale. So they're already doing, but they want to do more of it. So you didn't build that is a really, really important piece of this puzzle that is wrong, morally wrong, intellectually wrong, wrong in reality, wrong in fact. Individuals do create stuff. At the end of the day, all there is is individuals. There is no collective. Each one of you thinks for himself or doesn't think for himself. But nobody thinks for you. You don't think together. There's no collective consciousness up here. Group think is not, there is no such thing as group think. I mean, when we, if you go in a meeting and everybody's kind of spurring each other on, sometimes people call that group think. That's just people spurring each other on to think. But everybody in the room still has to think for themselves. They're not thinking together. They're each person thinking for themselves. The entity in the reality that exists is the individual, not the group. Wealth is the individuals, not the groups. Creation happens at the individual level, not the groups. doesn't mean we don't it trade. Means there's no collective property. There's no collective mind. There's only the individual. So, another way in which they try to undercut this idea of ownership, of, uh, you know, of, of, of a moral legitimacy to owning something, is this notion that, yeah, you might have built it, right? Bill Gates, okay, you, you created Microsoft, you did that. But there's nothing special about that. What, what, what allowed you to build Microsoft is luck. You were just lucky. I don't know how many of you have read the book Outliers by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And he goes into this whole thing, right? Bill Gates just happened to be in the right place at the right time and had the right parents. And he was born with the right genes in the right century. And everything just fell together and then boom, we got Microsoft. Now, he, he does it more eloquently than I do. Uh, he's a great writer. Awful ideas, but great writer. <laughs> and this is this is a notion. This comes out of John Rawls, the, the Harvard philosopher. And it's the notion that you don't deserve. Yes, you built it, but you don't deserve it because you didn't do anything about it. You're just a machine. You're just determined by your genes. You're determined by your parents. You're determined by society. You're determined by the group. So anything you produce isn't yours. It doesn't belong to you. Now, I think by observation you can see that this is just this is nonsense. I mean, there were lots of people in Bill Gates' school. There were lots of people who had nice middle class upbringings. There were lots of people like computer labs. He makes a big deal out of they had a computer lab in the school, and other schools didn't have a computer lab. Bill Gates took advantage of those opportunities. Other people didn't. Bill Gates made choices. What this evades, what this whole line of reasoning evades, is free will. Is the fact that what really shapes us is not just a bunch of genes. It's not just our parents, but it's the choices we make. It's what we do with the genes. It's what we do with the parents. I mean, it's, it's insulting, actually, <laughs> to some people who were born in poor families with abusive parents who become incredibly successful and overcome the odds. 
Because all you're saying is, well, they had good genes, it was just lucky. No, they made good choices. They worked hard. They are responsible for their success as individuals. So there's this whole luck argument, right? Now, I'm not saying you're not lucky. Luck is there, absolutely. Well, some people are born with good genes, some people are born with bad genes. But that doesn't change the morality of anything. Some people are born in rich families, some people are born in poor families. You can't say that that's good or bad morally, ethically. Is it moral to be born in a good family or to be born in a poor family? There's no, morality has no aspect, it's not bad, it just is. You're born, and then it's a question of what you do with it. Morality is only about the choices that you make, not about the situation that you're born into or the genes that you happen to have. So, in trying to establish this agenda towards equality, what, the, what the, those advocates have to do, they have to deny reality, they have to deny the very nature of reality, and they have to argue for a war, if you will, on reality in order to achieve this mythological equality. They have to deny free will, have to deny free will and claim that it's all just luck and it's a morally justified taking from some and giving to others. They have to deny that you built it, they have to deny individualism, and they have to adopt collectivism. All of these are philosophical arguments. And the way to combat the argument against inequality is to argue from a philosophical base. We have to be, if you believe, this fight, this fight against inequality or the fight for equality is a bad fight. You have to be able to argue for individualism, for free will, and as a consequence for your moral right to your own property. Because at the end of the day, equality, the fight for equality, the movement towards equality, necessitates Violating people's rights. It necessitates violence. Because, you know, I'd like to give this example. Some of you have heard it before. How do you make me and uh, LeBron James, I'm switching because you've got to use Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> LeBron James, <laughs> equal in basketball. Yeah. I'd be told the young audiences don't know who Michael Jordan is. <laughs> <laughs> How do you make me and LeBron James equal in basketball? I mean, you haven't seen me play basketball. <laughs> But let me just assure you that I'm not equal to LeBron James. I'm quite pathetic, right? I'm against basketball. How do you make a sequel in basketball? Yeah, you, you got to break his legs. But even if you break his legs, I'm so bad at basketball, you'd have to break his arms as well. But that's what you have to do. Whenever you have a situation of inequality, which is by nature, we're all unequal and you want to bring equality to bear, what you have to do is take the people who have more, take the people who are more talented, take the people who have achieved more, and break their legs. Break their arms. You have to inflict violence on them. Taking somebody's money, eh, money's not like breaking legs, oh, isn't it? What does it mean to take somebody's money? What are you taking from them? Power. You're taking part of their life, you're taking power, you're taking time. How do you make money? You make money through effort over time. I work 40% of my time and I'm working for other people because they get the money. It's taken from me. 40% of my life, 40% of my effort is going to the government, which means it's being redistributed and all kinds of people that I have no choice about, have no decision making about. They're stealing 40% of my life. 40% of my time is gone. My time is more valuable than my legs and arms. I, you know, break my legs, break my arms, give me the 40% back. I'll take that. This stealing life. So, yeah, you, we all laugh when we talk about breaking arms and breaking legs because it's like, it's, it's very visual. Oh, nobody would ever do that. Nobody would ever break people's arms and legs. That's ridiculous. But that's what they do. In order to establish equality, it's exactly what they do. Now you might be thinking, but wait a minute, isn't this country based on equality? Wasn't, isn't in the Declaration of, uh, Declaration of Independence, don't the founders talk about we're all created equal? 
Well, what's that about? What kind of equality are the founding fathers talking about? Well, even for the law, but more than that, it's the, you know, where does the law come from? And it's equality of rights. The only sense, the only sense in which equality means anything in politics is the equality of rights, equality of freedom. If you think about the 18th century when the founders wrote this, this is a century in which in Europe at the same time, they are aristocrats and they are peasants. They are people who are born into privilege and people who are born into servitude. Of course, right here in America, there were slaves and slave owners. And one of the great tragedies of history is that the founding fathers don't apply this idea of equality of rights to everybody and that they restrict it to whites, right? That's, that's a tragedy of history, but their intention is to apply it to everybody. So there are no people born into privilege, born into servitude. There are no masters and slaves. The idea of equality is that we're all free. Our freedom should be protected equally by the government. That when we're born, we're not born into some kind of unchosen obligations, unchosen duties. We are born to pursue our own happiness, right? It says. You have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everybody has it. We're all equal in that. It doesn't mean we will pursue it. It doesn't mean we'll be successful. Nobody's guaranteeing anything. All they're saying is, you are free to pursue your life free from what? What does freedom mean? When we talk about freedom, we're free from what? Coercion. Free from force. Individual rights mean living life free of coercion. You have a freedom to act in reality free of your neighbor's attempt to control you, put a gun to your neck, to, to the back of your head. That's what individual rights mean. They mean freedoms. That's why you can't have a right to health care or to food or to other stuff. You don't have a right to stuff because that stuff has to be taken from somebody. Right? Coercion needs to be used to get it. You have a right to pursue. You have a right to act. You have a right act on your own behalf, to seek the values that are necessary for your own life. Free of intervention through force. So we're equal in rights, and we're equal before the law, just as an application of the fact that we're equal in rights. That is the government who's responsible for protecting our individual rights, therefore must treat us all equally. Not as an aristocrat peasant, not as rich man, poor man, but what are the facts? What did you do? What is the punishment? Are you guilty? Are you innocent? Independent of all those arbitrary issues as they relate to the judgment. Again, the background is Europe, where that's not the case. You go to court and you're an aristocrat, you get a very different sentence if you go to the same facts and you're a peasant. It's equality before the law. The founders never meant anything about equality of opportunity or equality of outcome. They would have been horrified by the notion because there is no such thing. There is no such thing. And to achieve equality of opportunity in basketball, for example, right? To give me the opportunity to win, equal to the opportunity of LeBron James to win. What do we have to do? Break his arms and legs, which means we have to violate his rights. If we're breaking LeBron James's arms and legs, are we being treated equally? Do we have equal rights? No, he doesn't have rights anymore. When you try to establish equality of outcome, you violate the principle of equality of rights. Because to establish that equality, you have to violate, you have to take, you have to steal, you have to break, you have to repress. There's no other way to do it. There's no other way to do it. Establishing of equality requires violating people's real equality, violating their rights. If I'm being taxed at a high rate, and my money's being taken away from me and given to somebody who doesn't have any money, do we have equal, are we being treated equally? No, I mean, I'm being treated, I'm being cursed, he's being rewarded. 
in quotes, short term, right? <clears throat> Stuff is being taken from me and <clears throat> given to him. That's not equality of rights. My rights are being violated and he's getting free stuff. So any attempt to bring about equality of outcome, equality of opportunity is an attempt to violate some people's rights, not an attempt, in actuality, violating some people's rights for the benefit of some other people, for the perceived benefit of some other people. I don't actually think it's a benefit. For them. So political equality is only in a sense of, of, of freedom. Only in a sense of equality of, 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 uh, of freedom. That's it. And if you want a more dramatic example of what equality means, uh, there's one regime um, in history that is set out to achieve equality. That was founded for the purpose of achieving absolute equality between people. Not just of income, but equality. Complete equality. Uh, and this was a group of... Uh, of intellectuals trained in Western Europe, primarily in Paris at the Sorbonne, trained by some of the best egalitarian philosophers Europe had to offer. And they studied and they, they bought into this notion of equality. They were gonna, you know, they really became passionate about this. They went back to their country and they decided to implement it. They achieved political power and they said, we're gonna implement this. So they looked around the country and they saw a lot of people, you know, some people living in cities and some people living in the countryside. It's a pretty poor country. So they said, that's not fair. The people in the city seem to have more. It's cleaner. It's, you know, their lives are easier and so on. And, and these people in the, in the you know, in, in the countryside, they tend to be poorer. Their life is harder. Their work is more physical. So what are we going to do? We're going to empty the cities. So they kicked everybody out of the city. You weren't allowed to live in a the city. They emptied them out. Into the fields they went. But then they had a problem. Because even in the countryside, once you entered the cities, some people were smart, some people weren't so smart. Some people were strong, some people were weak. Some people were, you know, were, could read, some people couldn't read. So how do you equate that? How do you, get, how do you make all these people equal? Particularly if you want to do it fast. How do you do it? Kill them. <laughs> you kill them. You kill them. If you wore glasses, they shot you, because it was a sign of intelligence. If you could read, they shot you. If you had a college degree, they shot you. These are called the killing fields of Cambodia. And they killed two million people out of a population of five and a half million. They killed close to 40% of their own people, all in the name of equality. The only way to make all those poppies the same height is to chop down the ones that stick up. And when 40% of them stick up, you chop down 40% of them. You can still go to Cambodia and you can see those killing fields. <coughs> and you'll see what they did and why they did it. They're very explicit. <coughs> why they did it. In the name of equality. And it's just the Cambodians. And remember, it's always interesting, right? They were well educated. They could read. They didn't shoot themselves. It's always, these guys always, it's about making you all equal. We're too good for this, you know, for, for the treatment. So when I think about inequality, when I, when I think about equality, when I think about the war on inequality, when I think about a president or, or these intellectuals saying the virtues of equality, I think Cambodia, I think the Cameroon, I think Pol Pot, because that's what it's really about. We don't have them on the streets yet shooting people, but that's what it leads to. That's the logic of the argument. That's what equality is about. Equality of outcome is the most evil idea in human history. It's about killing people because they have ability. It's about destroying people because they have talent. It's about taxing people because they created wealth. Because they're good, we penalize them more. Because they're virtuous, we attack them more. As compared to the system of inequality, which is a system of freedom. A system where we create what we have. Where we use our talents and skills to make our lives better. Now there's one form of inequality which I think is bad. 
and law in which we live in to some extent today. So if you steal other people's money to become richer, then that's bad. That's wrong. That's unjust. That's what life was before capitalism. That's what life was before the Industrial Revolution. That's what that's how aristocrats got rich. Pre-industrial revolution. But there are some people in the world we live in today who get rich that way as well. We call it cronyism. But that's exactly what cronyism is. If you're going to the government for handouts, where's that money coming from? From somebody else that they took it from. If you're going to the government to get other your competitors silenced so that you can outcompete them, that's using violence against your competitors and becoming successful because of that. And to the extent there's any legitimacy to the arguments out there about inequality, it's this that should be stopped. This cronyism, this use of government, government is force, government is coercion. This use of coercion to make yourself better, richer, wealthy, that is fundamentally wrong, fundamentally immoral. But that's not what these guys talking about inequality really care about. Right? The Occupy Wall Street didn't care about cronyism. Just to use a local example, right? They hated cronyism on Wall Street. They demonstrated against all those Wall Street CEOs getting that money from government. But they loved the bailouts of the auto companies. So they had, they were selective, right? Some people getting rich off of the back of other people is okay. Other people, it's not. So it's not, it's not cronyism that the people who are advocating against inequality are really attacking. What they're really attacking is capitalism. What they're really attacking is freedom. What they're really attacking is individualism. And the system of capitalism, the system of individualism, you know, this is this is actually the system that's created all the wealth that we have around us. This inequality, the supposed evil of inequality, has made the life of the poor the best that it's ever been in human history. It's made all of our lives better than it could ever be under any other system. Inequality is a symptom, right, of a wonderful system and therefore should be celebrated. When I see somebody much richer than me, right, I don't say, oh my God, isn't that horrible? I go, good for him. And not just good for him, good for me. Because how did he become rich? By making my life better. That wasn't his intent. But that's the outcome. Bill Gates doesn't care about me. But the fact is, by getting rich, I my life got better. Inequality should be celebrated. Only a system in which we believe that Bill Gates should live for me, that Bill Gates' life is meaningless, that he needs to sacrifice himself to me, would I envy him? I don't envy him. I admire him. I respect him. I think... Any wealthy person who's made it honestly. You know, I have nothing but admiration and respect for. Because they made their life better. They made my life better. That's the kind of system that we should live in. That's the kind of system we should strive towards. And we should reject as evil in the movement towards equality. Celebrate the virtue of the system that produces inequality. Inequality should be solved. Thank you. So, Dr. Brent, how would you respond to an argument that states that, sure, nobody wants the killing fields of Cambodia and nobody wants that, but maybe we should have some form of safety net or minimum wage to stop people from getting maybe so up in arms that they're not being treated right, that they try to take maybe a radical step towards something? Yeah, so this is basically the argument. Look, we don't want to steal a huge amount of money from you. We only want to steal a little bit. <coughs> we don't want to shoot you. We just want to take a little bit of your life away. And to me, it's my life. You have no claim against me. You want my help, safety net, if you're in trouble, you can come ask me. I might help you. I might not. Depends on what's going on in my life. I'm not obliged to help you. So I reject the morality that says... The, the, the idea in morality it says that we have a responsibility to help people. We might or might not, depends who they are, depends who we are. 
I'm not born with the responsibility to my brother. I'm not my brother's keeper. A safety net is just a coercive method to establish my brother's keeping, that we are our brother's keeping. And I'm not, I mean, I may choose to help my brother, but if I don't like my brother, I'm not going to. Never mind my neighbor or, or a distant <coughs> relative on the other side of the planet. So I think a safety net is as immoral in principle as the welfare state. Both involve coercion, both involve stealing, both involve taking and violating some people's rights for the benefit of other people. And look, I, I'm a big believer in slippery slopes. I know some people say, uh, you know, slippery slopes happen all the time. Once you give in, once you say a little bit of coercion is okay, which is what a safety net is, just a little bit, just a really, really poor, we'll, we'll, and we'll only take from the very, very rich. Once you allow for a little bit of, of coercion, you allow for all coercion. You allow for the killing fields. It's not the same morally, but it's on the same direction, and you necess one necessitates the other long term. And, and the evidence is all around us, right? You know the first, uh, you know what the, the rate of income tax was when it was first instituted in the United States? 1%. It was 7%. Um, and who paid it? I thought it was 1% above 100 grand. Or something. What's that? 250,000. Yeah, 250,000, but, but like. What percentage of the population made that kind of money in those days? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah a tight, like I think it's 3% of the people paid income tax. And at the time it was passing, you know, they had to have a constitutional amendment to allow the income tax because it was deemed unconstitutional by Supreme Court after Supreme Court after Supreme Court. So they changed the constitution to allow for a income tax. So it started out, I don't remember, maybe it was 3%, maybe it was 7%, some low amount, very few people paid it. And they promised that it would never go up. That was 1913. It was implemented in 14. The United States entered World War I in 1917. Three years later, what was the top marginal income tax rate? 77%. <laughs> that's called, I don't know if that's a slippery slope. That's going to be a word for more slippery than slippery. <laughs> What's that? That's a slippery. <laughs> so once, what? so example, once you grant them the right to take an income tax, they're going to take a huge income tax. Once you allow for redistribution of wealth, they're going to do it en masse. There's no way to limit it because you've given up on the principle. And the principle is you cannot use coercion to take money from some people and give it to others. Not a little bit and not a lot. You just don't have a right to do that because coercion is bad. Coercion is evil. The government is supposed to protect us from coercion, not impose it itself. But there's a, a, a different form and element of the argument. I have a lot of, used to be liberal, now they're progressive, whatever they are now, friends, who say, uh, Randville, if we stop paying all these people, they're going to burn our cities down and come and kill us in our beds and take everything that we have. Practicality in the sense of, you can't go. You can't go back from where we are. They, there's no, there but you, see, you see, that's a complete rationalization. But they don't believe it. They've convinced themselves of that. But they don't believe it. They're trying to come up with a practical argument to appease their emotion and to appease your arguments against it. Right. The fact is that there's not a single example in human history of the poor rebelling against the free society. A society with its freedom. With this capitalism and the poor rebel because they're poor. They don't do it in Hong Kong. And, and, and the opposite actually happens. What's interesting is the opposite, right? What happens to societies with huge inequality and freedom? People immigrate. Millions of people immigrate, right? When in the United States we had this big inequality during the 19th century, millions of people came. And did the millions of people coming, were they all rich? No. No, they were dirt poor, ignorant. Incompetent, with no professions, nothing. I mean, it's true, right? What does the Statue of Liberty say? Give me your huddled masses, right? The poor, the, that's who came. I mean, you don't, don't, don't want to talk like this about your ancestors, I'll talk about mine. The Jews who came to America <laughs> lived in shtetls in Poland. They, they'd never seen a city. They didn't know there was, a, you know, a, a skyscrapers were like unimaginable to them. They didn't have skills, they didn't have knowledge, they didn't have education, they didn't have anything. All they wanted was a little bit of freedom and not to be killed by the Cossacks, right? 
<laughs> so they wanted to be free. They came here. They worked hard. They valued education, even though they weren't educated. So they sent their kids to school. And within a generation or two, they moved to class. To this day, even in America today, with social mobility, everybody tells us it's so constrained. Look at Asian families. Asian families, they come here with nothing. Nothing. Whether they escaped uh, in, boat, in little dinky boats from Vietnam and, and were in some camp and then, then were given political asylum in the United States. They're nothing. And then within a generation or two, their kids are at Stanford, they're engineers, they're doing phenomenally well. Because it's still true in this country that no matter what your background is, if you work hard, if you study, if you value education, you do very well. In spite of all the constraints and social mobility that people talk about. You know, it, it's interesting because I just read this. It turns out that blacks from Nigeria, for whatever reason, are doing phenomenally well in the United States. They come here again with nothing, but for whatever reason, they, they are hardworking, they value education. And in spite of the fact that supposedly we're a racist society and don't allow for blacks to, to be socially mobile, if you're from Nigeria and black, we somehow can discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's what you do with your life. It's a responsibility you take to do with your life as you. And if, if you come to work, if you're not, if you don't have an entitlement mentality, if you don't just expect to be given, then you can be successful. And there's plenty of evidence of, of exactly that happening uh, in America even today with all the all the constraints that we have. So I, you know, it's never happened. I don't I don't know of any example. Hong Kong. You know, millions of people are trying to get into Hong Kong all the time, even though there's no room, right? It's a tiny little place. They've already got seven and a half million people there. I don't know how many of you have been to Hong Kong. Anybody been to Hong Kong? An amazing place. Right? Most skyscrapers in New York City. Um, seven and a half million people live there. GDP per capita is equal to the United States right now. Uh, 75 years ago, there's nothing. There's a fishing. Why? Because they have political freedom, because they allowed inequality. And they have huge inequality. The poor in Hong Kong are very poor. And the rich in Hong Kong are very rich. And yet the poor from everywhere in the world, the world would love to emigrate to Hong Kong. Why? Because this they're left free. There's <clears throat> yeah. Oh, um okay, a two part question, but real quick. Um the state of charity back before all these social safety nets in the 1800s, could you ex expand on that, show us kind of the vision of that? And also, do you have any idea, I know that like uh, Glenn Beck and some other people um, have some idea of uh, setting up some kind of, you know, private charity um, or, or some sort of system um, now, you know, in, in this day and age. So this whole focus on charity, in my view, is completely misguided. Charity, I mean, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but for purpose, it's insignificant. It's not that important. Very few people actually need it if you really had a free market. Free markets create more jobs than there are people. 99.9% .9 of people can work and therefore don't need charity. Charity is for the outliers, for the free, freak accidents, for the people really born it's such bad condition that they can't work or have accidents that, 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 that make such that they can't work. But that is such a trivial number of people that, that you could solve that problem like that. The real problem is freedom. The real problem is lack of freedom, lack of, and as a consequence, lack of work, lack of the discipline to work, lack of the mentality to go and work. The real problem is when you hand checks to people, you institutionalize them into a mentality of entitlements into a mentality that's anti-work, anti-effort, anti-progress. So if we did away with the welfare state, you'd probably have to do it over a couple of generations, right? Just to change, so people can change. But, you know, I don't know what charity would look like. Now, in the 19th century, charity was very prevalent. There was a lot of it. Uh, there were hundreds of charitable institutions. But, but most of the way to deal with poverty had nothing to do with charity. It had to do with things like mutual aid societies were forms of insurance. Uh, you could buy insurance against, against unemployment, not that the state provided like we have today, uh, unemployment insurance. It's not insurance. It's unemployment redistribution of wealth. That's what it is. It's an unemployment welfare. There's no insurance there. Um, you're not, you're not, uh, uh, you don't pay unemployment insurance premiums 
based on the risk of becoming unemployed. There's no pool waiting for the, un for the unemployed. And, and when the pool gets depleted, when some states have small pools, when that gets depleted, they just tax people more and they reshuffle. It's just redistribution. It's, it, to use even the term insurance with that. But there were real insurance policies. Insurance against poverty, insurance against uh, unemployment. So there were market mechanisms that dealt with the freak accidents, with, with, the, with the unusual. And family helped, and friends helped, right? But to me, for conservatives, and this is what conservatives do, because they, 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 they feel guilty about it. Well, I don't feel guilty. Right? You know, people are poor, people are poor. People are rich, people are being poor in my life. You know, now I'm doing pretty well. I like to say, when I, when I arrived here from Israel, I emigrated here in 1987. All my possessions were in two suitcases, right? Everything my wife and I owned were in two suitcases. Today, I can't go for a weekend in Vegas with two suitcases <laughs> with my wife. <laughs> That's just shoes, right? <laughs> and if we had to move, it would be two, two semi-trailers, right? So, you know, poverty, hopefully, is something temporary that people go through, particularly when they're young, and they overcome it. But... You know, people like Glenn Beck are riddled with guilt. And therefore, charity becomes the most important thing they can talk about. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a trivial issue. America wasn't built in charity or community service or any of these things. It's fine. Do it. I have nothing against it. But it's not important in life. What's important in life is making stuff, building stuff, building your own life, creating your own life, building wealth, creating jobs, you know, creating values. That's what life is really about. You want to help people on the side? Great. But that's not what life's about. That's not what's important. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you. How do you address inequality among nations and morality, if there is morality, behind first world countries helping third world countries? So, um, nations are equal uh, for, for very similar reasons to individuals being unequal. Um, but with nations, it has more to do with the political systems that they have. So it's very clear why some country, why countries are poor. They're poor because they're not capitalist. They're poor because they're not free. They're poor because they don't have property rights. That's why they're poor. All rich countries, all rich countries, have to some extent or another recognized property rights. To some extent or another, they allow for capitalism. To some extent, they allow individual freedom. To some extent. And you can see China in the 1970s was dirt poor. There were a billion poor people in China. I mean, you went over there, it was horrible. I mean, the way that people looked, the way they dressed, they wore, everybody wore these great suits and they shuffled their feet and, you know, and, and, and it was poverty, adjunct poverty everywhere. And they allowed a little bit of freedom, a little bit of private property. You know, you could say it's pseudo private property because they can take it away anytime, but a sense of private property, some respect. For forward property and for individualism, and boom, the amount of wealth they created. Suddenly, you go to a place like Shanghai, and wow, they look, they, they dress like us, their billboards are bigger than ours, right? The Coca Cola billboards are much bigger than ours. Um, the city's lit up. I mean, they're wealthy. There's still poor people in China, <clears throat> hundreds of millions, because they have such a huge population, but there are hundreds of millions of people in the middle class. So, the function of rich versus poor is completely a function of freedom versus unfreedom, and the culture that is required for freedom versus the culture of unfreedom, lack of freedom. So you look country after country after country, you take the list of all the countries in the world, and you look at the countries that are the poorest, they're all unfree. They all have no respect for property rights, no respect for the individual. And, and no capitalism, no markets, no free markets at all, not even in a section of the, of the country, nothing. So, so if you care about them, I mean, everybody, everybody should care about them somewhat, right? They're human beings. You don't want to see human beings suffer. What is the best thing you can do to help them? Free them. Yeah, help, well, free them sounds a little aggressive, but <laughs> it sounds expensive in your lives and, and money. But the best thing you can do is, is, is teach them is get, get them to change their own political system, bring them freedom, right? Teach them about the benefits of freedom. So giving them money is not going to help. And indeed, where does the money come from? It has to be stolen from somebody. 
Now again, unless you give it charitably, but you know, it's not a very effective means. The most effective means to change, the, to, to improve the lot of the poor in the world is to educate them in capitalism, is to support free market capitalist ideas. I mean, one of the great tragedies is that Bill Gates doesn't get this. Because <laughs> Bill Gates is in a position to change the world. He's got tens of billions of dollars sitting in his foundation. <clears throat> And he could use that money to go to Africa, if he really cares about Africa, and really fund an institutional effort to bring capitalism to Africa, to change their culture, to respect property. It doesn't take much. There's a, there's a wonderful book by Hernando de Soto, de Soto who's, uh, I think, a, a Colombian economist. Colombia? Chile. 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 Okay. South America, anyway. Um, and he wrote a, a book called Capital Ideas. And he says, take, take a poor, poor country where you've got lots of these subsistence farmers. Right? None of them own the land which they farm because the land is owned by the state. So there's no property rights. He says, all you need to do is give them ownership of the land. Give them a document that establish the rule of law that gives them a property right over the land. And you've created capital. Because, for example, now they can borrow off of that piece of paper and start a business or buy another piece of land, or buy a tractor, or buy something that improves productivity. All you have to do is establish property rights, and you've increased the standard of living almost instantaneously of everybody involved. And here you have farmers who, who own the land by any legitimate moral sense, right? Because they farm it, they use it. Give it to them. Give them the ownership. So those are the kind of things that if you really care about poverty in the world, you want to establish. Just hand, giving them handouts. A, most of their money gets taken by corrupt leaders. B, even if it gets to them, it only solves their problem in the short run. It doesn't solve their problem in the long run. Most of them, you know, waste it. And, and you, again, you don't have the moral obligation to do it. He and, wants to do it, good for him, but he should do it right. Um, the other thing to remember, again, even about poor countries, <clears throat> And this is something that Bill Gates just wrote, which is where he's right. The world's never been in a better condition than it is today. There have never been fewer poor people than there are today. You know, as a percentage of the population. I mean, we're all glum because America is sinking and everything. But if you, if you think about the world, <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you guys are too young to be worried, but I am. I'm not too young to be worried. Um, I'm too old not to be worried. <laughs> But if you live anywhere else, if you live outside of the West, right, Europe, Western Europe, you know, communism's gone. If you live in Eastern Europe, life is great as compared to what it was just a few years, a few decades ago under communism. If you live in Africa, Africa's waking up. Many countries in Africa are establishing property rights, are building markets, standard of livings in Africa are going up in many parts of Africa, right? If you're in Asia, wow, the last 50 years, have brought out of poverty probably a billion people. A billion people. So in a sense of the well-being of the world, right? more people are doing well today than at any time in human history as a, as a percentage. Right? And, and that's something we, end, we don't appreciate. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there that, that we should stop and you know, smell the flowers once in a while. And it's all because of evil capitalism, right? <laughs> it is. It's all because of the wealth. It's all because of the capital. It's all because of property rights. It's all because of capitalism. And this is a system that's hated, despised by almost every professor in this university <laughs> and every other university in, New York, in, the, in the Western world, right? And that's a mystery in and of itself. But it's that's the reality. What's going to happen first? Is America going to completely embrace your uh, well, I mean, it's not clear that, that you have to go to one or the other. I think we can um, muddle along for quite a while before we have a complete embrace of either one. Um, I think we'll muddle along for a long time. Um, I think we'll continuously head towards more coercion for, for the foreseeable future because I don't see I don't see a shift. It's not a political issue because the Republicans <laughs> want to coerce you too. They just want to coerce different stuff. And they want to coerce you a little bit less on the economic stuff and a lot more when it comes to your bedroom and your private life. Right? So uh, 
there's no political party out there that's anti-coercion. That, I mean, respectable, real political party that's out there that's against coercion. Uh, and it's and there's no more importantly, there's no educational movement. There's no philosophical movement with exception of the people here, right, in the whole universe, right, this is it. Um, <laughs> or at least in Michigan. Um, who, are, who are against it philosophically, ideologically. And this, this has to become a massive movement for, the, for freedom to win. This has to become a student movement. I mean, I, I, I go to campuses and I tell students, and there, there's some here, I tell you guys, you guys should be in the streets right now. You guys should be demonstrating. You guys should be so ticked off and pissed off. You know, in the 60s, they had a draft. And students went out into the streets and they demonstrated. And they did things that I wouldn't justify. And I don't think we're right. But they were upset. They got up and they yelled and they screamed. And they and ultimately, the draft went away. You guys have a draft. They're not literally taking you and putting you in the military. But you, you today have so much debt on your shoulders, you owe so much money to your parents and grandparents that your futures, if they really, if your parents and grandparents really expect to be paid everything that they think they've been promised, then forget it, guys. You won't have a life. You have hundreds of, you don't know this, but you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of money that you owe right now to your parents and grandparents. Medicare, Social Security, Obamacare. Please sign up for Obamacare so I can sign up too. Because I'm sick and old and I need you to subsidize me. <laughs> Isn't that the commercial they're running on? Every yeah. Year? That's the commercial. It's exactly what they're saying. If you're young and healthy, please sign up. We need you. Why do we need you? Because we want to suck your blood. <laughs> We're vampires. And there's some sick people in you who need your blood and we need to put it in there. This is exactly what they're doing. Right? You should be ticked off. And us, at this generation... Sits up up front. You know, they call it the greatest generation. Our parents' generation, the greatest generation. I mean, how ridiculous is that? So they fought a war. Good for them. And they won it. The last generation won a war. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> other than that, other than that, all they've done is inflict debt and burdens on you guys. You should be out in the street saying enough. We don't want to pay for your Medicaid. Because when we're when when you guys are sixty five, there won't be any. I can guarantee it. And for every dollar people who take out Medicare, you know who I'm talking about, right? For every dollar they put into the system, which has already been spent, by the way, they will take out at least four. And who's going to pay for the extra three? Well, actually, all four, because one was spent already by them, by that generation. They spent it on other stuff. You have to pay the four. How can that be right? How can that be just? Isn't that like a draft? They're sucking the life out of you. They're sucking the blood out of you. And you're just like, yeah, who cares? <laughs> and when I get to, you know, as long as, as, long as, as, long as my parents get to pay my, my health insurance until I'm 26, I'm happy. Right? <laughs> I thought you guys wanted to be independent, right? I thought you wanted to leave home, break that biblical cord, right? So when does that collapse? <laughs> What's that? When, does, when that... does it collapse? I don't know. It could collapse next year. It could collapse in 2015 when the Fed runs out of whatever the smoking, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, because they have to be on something to be doing the stupid things that they're doing. Uh, it could run out next year. You could have a major economic collapse next year. Now, I don't think it's going to happen that soon because there's a lot of wealth in this country. And there's a lot of productive ability in this country. People still work hard. People are incredibly innovative. Uh, people are producing stuff. You go to Silicon Valley, and it, it's it's the opposite of Detroit, right? There's construction, there's building, there's innovation, there's there's wealth creation. There's people working hard. They're coming up with amazing new ideas. As long as that keeps going, you can s keep, you know, sucking their blood. There's a lot to suck. There's a lot to take. It's if you how many of you read Atlas Shrugged? Okay. The point is there are lots of Dagnes and Readings out there. Lots of them. And as long as Dagny and Weedon work, you can suck the blood out of them, right? And pay for all these goodies. And there are a lot of them out there. There are lots. You know, California now has a surplus. A budget surplus. How did they get a budget surplus? By raising taxes on Silicon Valley. And when Facebook went public, 
The state of California got a billion dollars of income of taxes from capital gains from one company going back. So as long as there are people creating Facebooks, which I assume is a productive activity, uh, <laughs> um, the government, you know, will keep sucking them and, and keep doing it. Now, so at some point it has to collapse, but it could take a long time. So, you know, you could have a major financial crisis next year. But even that wouldn't kill this country up. We're just too hardworking and too innovative and so on. This is, we've got probably a decade or two of, of, of sustained. But, but you see, the innovation is being reduced by regulation. So we still innovate and so on, but then you get Dodd Frank and Solvay Zoxy and the new, all these new regulations. And now, now Apple, right? Apple has a bureaucrat at Apple, right? A government, a court appointed person who gets a sign off on all the decisions of iTunes. Now, how innovative is Apple going to be? Can we pull in the wet nurse? Yeah, the wet nurse from, from Apple Shrug, right? right. right. And he, he, he gets to check up all the decisions on iTunes because, because of the antitrust lawsuit. How long do you think Apple's going to stay innovative when they've got a bureaucrat signing off on what they do? So those kind of things are going to kill the innovative machine and ultimately it will collapse. But it, it could take decades. You know, I don't know. There's a race, right? Can we turn the boat around and start sailing towards freedom before the cliff, right? Well, I, I, I've used in the past a waterfall metaphor, right? We're on a raft, on a river, heading towards a waterfall, right? And, and everybody on the raft has, a, has, a, has an oar, right, is rowing, and all rowing towards the waterfall. <laughs> That's the American people. Everybody's rowing towards disaster. We vote for them. We advocate for them. You know, that's where we're heading. What does it take to turn this thing around and start rowing in the opposite direction and actually move in the other direction? And do we have enough time before we drop off the waterfall? But when we drop off the waterfall, the likelihood that we climb back up is very small. Because history suggests that once economic collapse happens, we look for a strong man. We want somebody to give us the answers. And we go towards totalitarianism, not towards freedom. So we better get it rowing in the other direction before we hit the waterfall. You know, I don't know what happens first. I certainly hope that we start moving towards freedom. Not that we have freedom, that we start moving towards freedom before we drop off the thing. And time is limited. I think we've got 20 years. I don't know if we have much more than that. I have a question about your institute when you have time. Okay. Yeah. That's quite a dramatic turnaround we have to make. So what do we do? Do we all start a movement where okay, we refuse to stop, uh, pay our taxes? And if I mean, the IRS can't put thousands of us in jail. Well, it can. Um, history suggests. <laughs> history suggests it certainly can and will. Um, what I think you should do is advocate for the truth. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm serious about the students should be out in the streets. There should be a student movement, you know, against the, the, the redistribution of their wealth. There should be a student movement against large government, and not just a student movement. It sits around and studies ideas and reads books, which is great, all good. But you need to go out there. You need to show yourself. You need to make the argument. I, I love the fact that you guys are suing the University of Michigan. I mean, that's true. I mean, that's exactly the kind of stuff that you say. I mean, you need to stand up and you need to make yourself good and you need to give a voice. And if you do it, people will listen to you much more than if I do it. I'm like this. You know, crazy intellectual who's an Iron Man advocate. And, you know, but you're just, you're just young people who are being screwed. And people get that. And you, there's got to be a substantial voice. And it has to be your generation. Our generation's done. Right? We don't have enough time. Your, genera your generation is going to fall off the cliff. 20 years from now, you know, I'll be okay. Right? Put enough gold in the garden or whatever, and I'll be fine. <laughs> You're the ones who won't have it because you won't have the opportunities I have. You know, I worry about, I do this, you know, partially because my, I have kids. I have kids your age. And, you know, where are they 20 years from? That's what worries me. It's like, you guys need to get angry. You guys need to get really pissed off. And stand up. And it does, that doesn't mean smashing windows. It doesn't mean occupying buildings. It means voicing your concerns. Don't do what the left did in the 60s. Right? Do it. Like people who respect property rights and respect freedom and respect individualism, you know, but make your voices heard. Get out there. That's, that's what needs to be done. There's no alternative to education. There's no alternative to convincing people. 
changing people's lives. And make the arguments right. That is, you know, one of the one of the one of the reasons, you know, I'm a pretty passionate guy, as you can tell. I get passionate talks, right? And they're effective, I think, partially because they're passionate. Why am I passionate? And most free market economists are boring. They are, right? Not to name names. <laughs> because I am morally offended by this stuff. It's not just a theoretical economic graph to me. This is about morality. This is about life and death. This is about good and evil. This is about, you know, the real life. And that's how you have to feel about it. Not a theoretical game of economics. But in morality, what's good and evil? And I'm standing for the good, and I'm going to fight for the good. That's pretty passionate. So, and that's what young people need to do, and they need to express that. It's the only way. I don't know any other way. Get your friends to read out the show. <laughs> no, I'm saying quickly. It was uh, at this university just uh, yesterday where a philosophy professor, uh, this was put on our group page, um, put a uh, put Ayn Rand's name on the board and uh, talked about her for a minute or so, then uh, crossed out her name, sat down, and said she's a joke, basically. And uh, we can't, you know, take her ideas seriously beyond childhood. This no! kind of atmosphere we have to deal with here. I mean, we can't yeah. actually say anything. It's, it's the kind of atmosphere you have to deal with everywhere. I mean, it's not unique to University of Michigan. Part of the way to discredit <laughs> us is to do exactly that, right? It's to not take the ideas seriously, not to discuss them, because if they discuss them, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. right. So the easiest thing to say is, eh, that's just a joke. Who's, you know? And to tell you, you all, you're all reading a book that's appropriate for 14-year-old boys. Right? You grow out of it. Everybody grows out of it. I didn't. But then, you know, I'm, I'm straight. But, <laughs> so that's ad hominem. That's not a serious intellectual debate. That's, but that's the atmosphere in all universities. But again, the only way to stand up for that is for, for you guys to get good grades and then in a respectful way stand up against it. You know, argue against it, stand up against it, demonstrate against it, show that you really believe in something. And that you're not crazy hippies, right? You're not the 60s generation. <laughs> you're serious. Um, you talk about these people needing to do something. I equate that to when you talked about Africa. What's the problem in Africa? It's what the people are learning. It's the same thing here. It's what are the people learning. In order to change a culture, in order to change a, uh, a, uh, a generation, that generation needs to be educated in the right way. Sure. This university, that university, <clears throat> that university over there are not teaching these principles. Well, that's right. Yeah, but so how do you change that? Yeah, but if, if we try to take over all the universities and forget it, it's going to take too long. It's going to take hundreds of years. I mean, it took the left 100 years to take over the universities, and that was relatively easy now that they're established. It'll take us more than 100 years to do it. So you have to have shortcuts. You know, getting your friends to read out a shrug is a shortcut, right? Going out in the street, advocating and making loud noises so that the kids around you maybe get educated is a shortcut. Uh, use the web. The web is in a phenomenal shortcut. If, if we're going to succeed in the battle for freedom, it'll be because of technology. Because now we have a tool, which is the web, to educate people without their parents, without this teacher's knowledge, right? Because you all, everybody goes on the web all the time without anybody knowing what you're looking at, right? At a marginal cost of zero. I mean, never. You don't have to print books. You don't have to travel. You don't have to, there's no cost. You put, a, you put educational content up on the web. And people can consume it at a marginal cost of zero. It's just a question of getting enough people to consume it. So you have to spend some money on marketing. But that's it. So we have an opportunity. And, and indeed, the, the university as we know it today won't exist in 50 years. Because technology will make it obsolete. Particularly given what's being taught. So we need to become an alternative educational source. We need to undercut. So, for example, one of the things the Institute does, the Ayn Rand Institute, is we offer Ayn Rand's books to any high school teacher who will teach them, right, in the country. We ship 400,000 books. The teacher just thinks they're teaching literature. We know they're teaching, philosophy. you know, a revolutionary philosophy that's undercutting everything the teacher believes in. <laughs> 
That, that's how you get around the system. You get you get your material hopefully into people's minds without having to go through the the thought control police of the of the uh, school board and so on. Uh, so there are all kinds of mechanisms to do that. But if we literally said so when we have to take over the universities, it's too late. There's not enough time to do it because I do think we only have 20 years. So I mean, the more people we get in universities, the better. But we're not going to take them over. You know, it's, and it doesn't matter. You know, history is determined by the minority always. It's, it's the mi minority. It's the focal minority. It's the intelligent minority. It's a passionate minority. But minorities shape history. Uh, we, we live in a country that's politically correct and overwhelmingly left of where I believe the center is because the left was a tiny little minority a hundred years ago and they made a lot of noise and they had the moral high ground and they were passionate and they talked about philosophy and they undercut the right at every opportunity. And they won. But they won a majority. There's still not a majority in this country. Your professors don't represent the majority of people in the country. Most countries, most parents are horrified when they learn what the kids are being taught. Right? But, you know, so we're a minority. It doesn't bother me. We just need to be a more vocal minority, a more passionate minority, a more morally certain minority. And that's what Ayn Rand gives us, is that moral certainty. Do we have questions? One, one, one more. If there is one. Well, I wanted to ask you about the Institute. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I corresponded uh, for a while with Alan Gotthel, and uh, eventually was moved to make a donation to the Anthem Foundation to support his... So it strikes me that this might be an insider question. Can yeah. you ask? No, 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 no. no, 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 no it, well, if, if, I'd say something later if anybody wants to know what all that's about. But um, uh, one of the things I asked Dr. Gotthelf was, is there, in essence, an Ayn Rand Institute professor here somewhere close by I, mean, I sort of picture these guys as sort of apostles of the institute in some regards yeah. out yeah. there where they are. There, there, there are grounds here. Uh, um, there are not enough objectivist professors to spread them across all 50 states. Uh, so there's nobody that I know in Michigan. Uh, but I, I give you an example because it's funny that you, you mentioned this. Uh, yesterday, I was having uh, I, I had a meeting with uh, one of the most successful young entrepreneurs in America. He's taken I don't know, five companies public. He's you know incredible, incredible uh, young individual, huge Irish mm -hmm. fan. And we're sitting and he says, "You want to have somebody in the Chicago area who could teach me philosophy? I, I really you know I'll pay. He's very wealthy. He's a billionaire. And he's, you know he's got money, and I'll pay somebody to teach me. You know." Uh, um, just philosophy, you know, the history of philosophy. I said, yeah, there's, there's an objective philosopher at, at Loyola University, and, you know, I'm going to put the two together and get it done. So there are people out there, it's just not in every state, and they're not enough. I mean, I, we need more. Yeah, there, there is fertile ground here. Uh, Grand Valley State University is a place with a much different intellectual atmosphere than there is here. Hillsdale College has its own private kind of thing going by. Look, there's, there's opportunities everywhere. It's, it's, you know, I travel all over and I speak all over. And there are opportunities everywhere and there, there, there are good people everywhere. And, you know, this is doable. Changing the world is doable. But it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And it's going to take young people standing up. And there's a great voice. I want to do a commercial because I know that most of these people do not listen to WJR out of Detroit. But if you had the radio on during the Frank Beckman show, you would have heard Dr. Brooke on the radio yeah, today, today Frank, Frank Beckman. Beckman. Yeah. And he's a great voice for yeah, what we believe in. Yep. No, I mean, there are good voices out there. I, I, you know, in fact, I don't want to be some hopeless, because we shouldn't be hopeless. There are good voices out there. And the more we give them kind of the moral backbone, the more we give them the philosophical foundation, the better voices they will be and, and, and the greater success I think we 